Hello everyone, we are today at the Panzermuseum Munster and I'm here with a former Leopard 2 gunner and we talk about the underdogs of the Ukraine war in terms of tanks, namely the Leopard 1 and the T-62 and the T-55. So what is in your opinion or from your knowledge, because you know quite a lot of tanks and also deck tactics and doctrine, what are the main differences, strengths and weaknesses these vehicles have against each other? Well, the thing is, the major difference of these three vehicles compared to all other vehicles that are used is uh, the simple armor that they're using. They are, don't have composite armor. Uh, to some degree, the Leopard 1A5DK, supplied by the Danish, uh, now have at least uh, some like uh, different kind of armor that it has, like spaced armor in the turret. But uh, in general, these vehicles have some upgrades uh, fitted. For example, T62M has a uh, add-on put on it, but the base armor is uh, compared to, to other vehicles weak because they, we, these vehicles were designed in a time where armor deemed unnecessary because new rounds like heat FS was developed. So uh, these vehicles, especially the Leopard 1, go, went for mobility. But uh, what's not uh, to underestimate, especially for the Leopard, is its gun. And its gun is uh, still in, to this day used in several countries. and. Uh, Availability of ammunition for it is superb and it can deal even with T-72s. It can penetrate T-72s and it can deal without a problem against every other vehicle. And uh, those Leopard 1A5s got uh, modernized extremely. Those are not uh, like the same vehicles that got introduced in the 60s in the German army. And these new fire control systems, uh, thermal imagers, for example, a thermal imager gives you so much more combat power, not only at night, but also on day, that you can see stuff that you can't see normally or makes you see it faster. So it's still a very dangerous vehicle. It's stabilized, of course, the gun stabilized, so it can engage targets even in the move. And it has a relatively good uh, reverse speed, so it can also back off, so it can use uh, in a defensive situation, the Leopard 1. And therefore, the Leopard 1 is a quite good vehicle. It's not as well armored as like a Leopard 2A4, or A5, or A6, but its combat power and its value is still not to underestimate because so, it can deal with. So basically, the fire control system was upgraded to about the level of a Leopard 2A4. Yes. Now, in terms of the T62, in comparison the firepower, how does it compare to the Leopard? So in both the fire control system and the ammunition? I mean, uh, thanks to the widespread of the Leopard 1, it uh, received many kinds of ammunition. It's using a NATO standard gun, the L7. So you have ammunition developed by Americans, you have ammunition developed in Israel, you have everywhere ammunition developed. And uh, there was like a market, so you have even better and better and better rounds. While the T62 received its last rounds, that's very long ago, so it has to use all the rounds that uh, weren't made to deal with Leopard 2s, let's say it this way, or other modern tanks. So they have less penetration power. Can it, can it engage a T-72, like the Leopard 1? Depends on where, where it hits. I mean, so I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it. I, so, so basically the chances of a Leopard 1 dealing with a T-72 from the front is way better yes. than a T-62. Yes, that's uh, a big difference. And uh, I mean, there was, I think, trials with the T-62 to put in the rod of uh, 125 millimeter rounds and uh, adjust it to the uh, smaller caliber because the T uh, T-62 is using a smaller caliber than the T-72. But uh, the T-72 is slower to the Leopard. That's a big uh, disadvantage. But we also saw a lot of uh, modernizations from the Russians that they are currently doing, like uh, fitting also thermal imagers to the vehicle and uh, trying to improve its combat capabilities for it. But we also saw that both T-62 and T-55s were used uh, not in a direct fire role, like the Leopard 1 was made, but also often in an indirect fire role and as a straight up infantry support. While the Leopard 1 was more built with the aim to destroy tanks. That's the, what you can see with the available ammunition types. You have the APFSDS, you have uh, back then in the Cold War you had the hash round, for dealing with vehicles, and you have the heat FS rounds. So it's mainly for armored targets to destroy actual vehicles, while you have a wide set of uh, HE rounds for the T-62 and T-55s. And, and this is a very important point because um, Butya, who is a, combat, a German combat engineer currently serving in Ukraine, and he points out that over the air, 
nearly every weapon gets used in an indirect fire role. And that, that is basically how, like he notes, that there are tables on the grenade, uh, on the on a granite launcher and everything else for, for how to engage enemy targets at, at indirect, uh, an indirect fire, like range tables and all the other information, which is rather uncommon for, for Western countries. And, and he especially noted, I think he mentioned that in Afghanistan there was some preliminary tests done or something like this, but basically over there in Ukraine it, it's like, yeah, this is, this is co complete common. Now, in terms of fire control, how do you know, is the T-62, does it have a stabilized gun? T-62 and T-55 have a stabilized gun. The first Russian tank that had a stabilizer was the T-54A. It was but, but only on a single level, so it uh, doesn't rotate the turret, only keeps it uh, on the same yeah, level, so you can... It's more like an aiming help, it's not for engaging, that you can have a shorter stop. And the first full stabilized Russian tank was the T-54B. That was the first one that had the complete stabilizer, but uh, it's not on the same degree as with uh, Leopard 1A5. It's, uh, it has its limits, the stabilizer of the Russians, even the lim uh, limits of the T-72 stabilizer, and uh, it's not comparable. It's, uh, the quality of the Western stabilizers are obviously because of the electronical development that was in the late of the Cold War, is better. And in terms of armor protection, there's not much difference, I suspect, between them. I mean, you can see uh, the add-on armor that was developed for T T62 and T55. For example, the T55AM was the modernization for the T55, and you have the T62M. They received add-on uh, composite armor of uh, polyethylene and the steel plates. That's like uh, polyethylene steel, polyethylene steel. Is it that on the turret? This the and on the hull. Browse? And on the hull. Ah, and, and on, on the, the hull. hull. Okay. And this add-on armor brings the armor at least on a level like with the T72. So even early the T-72 Euro. Yes, yes, and uh, like the M1. But uh, the problem is for, for these tanks... The, the T-72 M1, not the M1 Abram. Yes, <laughs> and not the T-71 M1, only the T-72 M. And uh, the thing is that like the T-62, we saw versions with this add-on armor put on it, but we also saw versions with ERA, like it's either. It's either ERA or this add-on armor. ERA is explosive reactive armor and basically deals with heat rounds, yeah. Yeah, because these vehicles have a weight limit, because the chassis wasn't never developed during the 60s for such extremely weight. So you can't put like this add-on armor and the ERA on top of it. It would make the vehicle way too heavy. And now, U Ukrainians are well known for putting explosive reactive armor on nearly everything, so it's a bit of a meme. Um, now you need a, a certain amount of minimum, basically steel, to put a, a explosive reactive armor on, else it might endanger your tank as well. Is there enough armor on the on the Leopard One to put air on it, or is, are there some limitations? I mean, there are said to be, also by other people and uh, a lot of experts, that the side armor of the Leopard is roughly the minimum. Okay. So it's something if you want to go with it, or don't want to go with it. I mean, putting error on it uh, makes the vehicle heavier and uh, slower. And if it doesn't help you, it's uh, not good. But the uh, frontal armor should be enough. And especially the add-on armor that is on the Leopard 1A5 also helps. And with the Leopard 1A5 DK, the Danish one, that has like this boxed turret, a completely turret, uh, different turret design than this one, it has uh, more armor and it should be available. But that's, uh, again, the question if you want to trade off like the mobility for this extra protection, because the engine is not as powerful as with a Leopard 2. And we should also add that tank versus tank engagement, at least the Butya and some others, it's very uncommon in Ukraine. And we should generally not think about this like he always complains, yeah, you're comparing like playing cards with each other, which does not, which is a bit of a problem. We should not do this, but so we add this here, but People generally want to know what is the difference between the tanks, so we usually do these comparisons because they also make, to a certain degree, also sense. Because I know that the Bundeswehr specifically compared the Leopard with the T72 because, well, what tank do you use and in large scale and everything else? So, and a lot, of, and Buddy also put out he never saw a tank, I think, basically, but in, in indirect fire, he was shot at by tanks several times. 
There's one thing I want to like to add that these old vehicles, T55s and T62s that were developed in the 50s or even late 40s, uh, like the T54 that is already also in service again, and the T62, that those vehicles were purposely built for indirect fire, that they have like the measurement in it and the uh, devices. You can actually aim indirect with it. You can adjust the, the firing by uh, degrees like every artillery gun. And with the current conflict that you have like these cheap drones, that someone is using a cheap drone to uh, adjust this fire that makes these very old tanks that are sometimes 60, 70 years old still dangerous. But because of all, this is a 100 millimeter field gun and this is a 150 millimeter field gun. Yeah, and uh, from, because I have also a large stockpile of regulations and stuff like this, uh, also from the Cold War. And I know, especially for the patents for the M47, M48 in the German army, there was uh, training for indirect fire against aerial targets in like this, uh, in German it's called Gabelverfahren. Ah, yeah, um, that's um, bracketing. bracketing. That you always half down until yeah. you inside the target. And this is extremely better now because of these drones. There weren't these drones back then. You have someone with a drone flying around. The T-55 can stand away like seven to 10 kilometers. I think with a full uh, charge sharp, it's I think 14 kilometers maximum shooting range of uh, high explosive fragmentation. And uh, he is in, in a safe position. And compared to a um, towed gun, like a D-25, uh, that you have to like redeploy, you have to fold yeah. it back. This vehicle is first protected against like mortars or other stuff going around next to it. It won't survive a directed, yeah. but it will survive like a high explosive round going down 30 meters next to it. But the D25 crew won't survive it. Yeah. And this vehicle can move away faster. Yeah. That's so, a big difference. So basically it's, it's protected against counter battery fire due to mobility and armor protection. Whereas a, yeah, a towed gun not so much. I mean, if you think about the caliber of the gun and you compare it to uh, self-propelled howitzers in the Second World War, it's a similar caliber. Yeah, um, like the Vespa or the M7 Priest, it's 105 millimeter. The Hummel had 150, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you, you have to think about the, the roots of this gun. Well, it was a naval gun, the, at least the 100 millimeter gun of the T-55. And uh, it still can do what it was designed to. And it will still kill you. And uh, even T-62 or Leopard 1, and uh, T-55, and even T-54 is still a tank. Yeah. And if you are a rifleman, you can't do anything against it. You can shoot with your rifle, nothing will happen. And against a, a tank, you will come short. Yeah, and also there's a lot of, like, there's riflemen, then there's APCs, then there's infantry fighting vehicles. So the tank is at the top of the food chain. And so even the lowest tank in the food chain is quite dangerous to most other weapon systems that he will encounter on the battlefield. Of course, against an ATGM or in an ambush, a tank is also basically a target, like everything else. So, because some people say, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a steel coffin, but both sides still produce tanks and both sides call for tanks and they have their reason for this. So- And we see new developments. Yeah, as well. Also they adapt. Okay, anything else to add? Not from my side. Okay, then thank you very much, Tobias. Thank you to the Panzer Museum Monster for inviting us. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.